<clears throat> Good afternoon. My name is Lillian Burkunder, and I am a resident of Bell Park Place. And today, I would like to introduce you to our fine art collection. We really have just started to build it, and it is still very modest, but we hope that it will continue to grow. Mostly, it has been donations by our very generous residents and a few pieces that we actually commissioned. We will start our little tour here <clears throat> on a small corridor right off of the lobby where we have three beautiful watercolors. Now, I don't know how much you know, but watercolor is the most unforgiving medium because once the pigment and the water, which is the binder, have been absorbed by the paper, there is no way an artist can make any changes. The painter, or the in, uh, watercolors are actually called drawings. Why, I don't know, it doesn't make sense. They're more, they're more they look like paintings, but they're known as drawings. And the artist is Emily Tolliver, who was the resident at Bowen Park, and she's also the donor. As you can see, we have three, two others, and they are all very delicate and very, very nice. If you stand in front of them, they make you feel that you're outside on an autumn day or a summer day over there. And um, that is one of the purposes of art, is to take you out of yourself and make and take you to a hitherto unknown world. So we'll go on and see what else is done in this corner. This is one of my favorite paintings in our whole collection thus far. Um, it was painted by Janice Barker, another resident artist and uh, Janice died <clears throat> fairly recently at the age of 103. She and her husband gave us this wonderful painting. Now let's talk about the painting that's more important. Um, it is called Italy Assisi and Janice and her husband who's a Hopkins doctor um, went every summer to Italy, where she painted, and he probably played tours on Zoom. Um, as you can see, the colors are vivid, and they just capture, I think she captured the absolute essence of a warm Italy summer, and the incredible joie de vivre of the Italians. As you can see, the colors are called Bovis, because the focus use color in a very idiosyncratic and personal way, so that grass didn't have to be green and sky did not have to be blue. Rather, it was a, a way of simply attracting people, attracting you with the with this vibrant color, which makes makes the whole thing come alive. This large piece is also another donation by current residents, and it is a print. When we talk about a print, we are talking about multiple issues or multiple examples of this, so that an artist decides ahead of time how many prints they want to make. In this case, uh, the artist wanted to um, I think it's 39 prints, and this is not uh, this is, oh, it's, it's 21 of 35. That means that this is the 21st print to come off the press, and at 35, the artist would destroy the plate, and in order to protect the integrity of the edition. Um, when I say uh, destroy the plate, you're probably wondering, what that is. Well, the plate, depending on the 
whether it's an aquatint or an lithograph or an engraving or, or whatever, uh, the print would be a tablet made out of, if it's a lithograph, it's a large stone. If it is uh, an aquatint like this one, it would be either copper or steel plate on which the artist would actually draw his image. He would do it, in this case, by covering the plate with, with um, wax, and then taking a stylus with a very sharp point and drawing in the wax, which makes, which would uh, expose the, um, the steel or the copper. Uh, and then, once he had finished his whole image, in this case, I'll, I'll talk about this one in a minute. He or she has finished the image. They would then put it in a hydrochloric acid bath that would cut into the plate and create the image. Then, once that is done, once the whole image is on the plate, the artist would move the wax and the, and put a paper with the image on it on top of, of the uh, <clears throat> excuse me, on top of the plate, which has been inked. And usually if it's just black and white, it would be black ink. And if it's multicolored like this, believe it or not, there's a different color, there's a different plate for each color. So you've got a pale blue, gray, Black, a little bit of yellow, a little bit of red, so that you would have that many plates, and each paper would have to be put through the press that many times. So it's really quite complicated. Um, now, this artist is called Pat Steer, and she is an American artist and um, is quite well known in both in the United States and in Europe. Her major works are huge, and are really, really huge. Um, water, waterfalls, paintings of waterfalls, which are in most museums in the United States and in Europe. Her love of water comes through on this particular piece, which is what we would call it abstraction, and an abstraction is the exaggeration of an artist's view of reality. So that in this case, what we're seeing here, magnified super many times, is the splashing of water on a hard surface. It comes down and it goes That's what she's doing. I love this painting. When I see it, when I stand in front of it, and I visit all of these paintings every single day. So that when I say I love it, it's, I love the one I'm standing in front. Really, that I'm like a butterfly. Okay, the last flower is the most beautiful. But I, what I love about this painting is the serenity. It is by another American artist, and it was also a gift from her residence. Uh, the artist's name is Emile Melo II. And uh, <clears throat> he calls this respite interior interlude. So I'm not really quite sure what he means by all that. But I have the feeling that the respite means we're stopping for a minute. And he has this light that clearly is coming from that window. And over here, there's more light that comes down the way. But what I think is important about this painting, more than anything, is the fact that it communicates this wonderful sense of calm and quiet. And it's very nice to look at now that we have Corbin, and we all need to be calm and quiet. And um, yes, this painting really, really fulfills that. It's a wonderful piece. It is an oil on canvas, 
oil courses much easier. You never touch paintings, by the way. You see that I stopped sure. touching it. But um, oil is much easier because it takes a while to dry, and therefore, in that time, the artist can change his mind and scrape off the paint and start over again. Unlike watercolors, where I told you the artist has no choice but to tear up the paper and start over again on a new one. These textiles uh, are the oldest pieces in our collection. They were given several years ago by, <clears throat> by, by Edward McCracken in honor of his wife, in memoriam of his wife, who had been the director of the Textile Museum in Washington, D.C., a museum that is devoted entirely to textile art, which if you haven't visited, you should. Okay, let's begin with this one. This one is Andea from the Andes Mountains in South America most likely from Bolivia, which is a landlocked country in the Andes. The material is probably wool, and it would be the wool of the alpacas. You know what alpacas are, they're the camel family, but they are very um, nervous animals, and they could never be made east of birth. So the pre-Columbian, <clears throat> South Americans, the pre-Columbian people prior to Columbus's arrival, the indigenous people, um, did these wonderful textiles with very beautiful geometric patterns and beautiful colors which survived over the years. Um, it would have been done probably by a woman on a small uh, portable loop. And the, the dye would be either mineral or vegetable. And, uh, and as I said, the material would be alpaca wool. Um, the colors are, are really quite bright. Although both of these have a problem. For years, they had been <coughs> framed incorrectly and they were not protected from light or from sunlight. Therefore, they have faded so that if you can imagine these colors, much, much brighter. This one is our earliest piece. It dates from the late 18th to the 19th century. Certainly after the conquest, but still very much in the earlier styles, which are still being produced today. This one is from Central Asia, and um, again, it is probably either cotton or wool, and done again on a small loom, uh, loom, excuse me, loom. And uh, <clears throat> it was originally a woman's skirt, which we have tried to suggest with the way it has been uh, framed. If we opened it, when we went to conserve it and reframe it, we opened it, and it is huge. We had hoped to show the entire skirt, but are unable to do so because the part that is folded here behind is so much brighter than this, so that the contrast was simply not good. Um, but it, it dates from the early 20th century. Um, and we are really very thrilled to have these pieces because they really are museum quality. This room is all about minimalism, which is exactly what, what it says, minimalism. Minimal, the least amount of. Um, we will start with this wonderful piece that Rolopart commissioned for this curved wall. And the artist is a young Baltimore artist, which we would like to really support the Baltimore artists who are emerging and uh, in, in, in our outreach into the community. 
Rosa Parks feels very strongly that we are part of a community and that as part of the community, we should support that community. In this case, I am focused on young artists who are emerging. David, David Brown, this is his name, is the perfect example of an emerging artist. He is actually making quite a name for himself outside of Baltimore. Um, <clears throat> and we are very fortunate to have this piece, which he actually created for us especially. He also spent an entire day installing it piece by piece. Okay, let's talk about the piece. The piece is um, enamel paint on wood, on wood, and it consists of 24 16 by 16 different um, blocks. Um, and then the enamel paint is very beautiful and shiny. And then on that, he has painted very carefully with a small brush in silver this sort of chain-like decoration, decorative element, if you will. The piece is called <clears throat> Silver on Blue Enamel, and that tells you everything. Don't ask me, what is it? The answer is, it is silver on blue enamel. And what we have here is the quintessential um, representation of what we call not only minimalism, but actually non-representative, not representative or non-objective um, art, which means it is not a recognizable, a recognizable piece such as a figure or a landscape as we saw in the first in the first room. Um, it is in fact paint and and decorative pattern. That's all it is. Now you're going to say, well, but how am I supposed to look at it? Very simply, Vasily Kandinsky at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, was the uh, was the artist who left the objective world behind in his paintings and decided that form and content could indeed be the same. Form is the material, excuse me, is the material and the, um, <coughs> the uh, technique and uh, content, of course, is the subject matter. So, when you look at this, what I really want you to do is listen to Kandinsky. He's, he's talking about both modern at the time, music and modern. So look with your eyes, listen with your ears, and stop thinking. In other words, don't ask, what is it? <clears throat> if the piece is taken to a hitherto unknown world, what more do you think? And in fact, that I think is all art tries to do that. It tries to take us out of ourselves into something beyond us. Maybe something in the natural world, or maybe something that is not in the natural world, but is simply um, transcendent. Something that we don't necessarily have the words for, but it's more of a feeling that we are building. So I'm not looking at this. You get lost in this blue and silver design. And you really don't have to have a subject matter. You don't have to have a person or a thing to look at. The beauty of it is that your imagination and your heart and your soul can just soar when you come in and see something like this. Next are the two monoprints um, in, on this other wall. And as you can see, their form has a wonderful, quiet, 
whispering conversation with <clears throat> David Brown for. At least I'd like to think that when not here, they talk to one another. And uh, these are monotypes. They're prints. You wouldn't believe it, but the artist goes through that whole thing with the plate and inking it and the whole thing, but he only makes one. <clears throat> so this is another Baltimore artist. His name is David Shapiro. They're both Davids. David, the Davids own this room. And as I said, I think it is a beautiful visual conversation between these three pieces. Now we come to something absolutely incredible. At least if you find it in a small collection like ours. And that is this bronze sculpture. The artist is, <clears throat> the artist's name is Soro Ertog. And he was born in Romania as a young man went to study art in Israel and from Israel went to Canada, where he became very famous, and his, his work, particularly his sculptures, are in many, many um, <clears throat> Canadian museums. If you take a minute to look at it, it is a figure, but you can see that it is a strange figure. You say, oh, come on now. People don't look like that. So, <clears throat> because it is influenced by Cubism. Cubism, I guess the best way for me to explain it to you would be you take a figure and you shatter it. And then this is virtually. And then you pick it up and put it together. But you don't necessarily put two eyes here. You might put one eye here and one eye here. You might take the brush and move them around to the side or to the back. And you simply distort the figure. Um, which is, again, it's just a matter of control. But <clears throat> raw sculptures like this are also made in additions. Now, this is one of only seven. Um, and, of course, they require the, um, I don't want to touch it. I mean, I feel like touching it, but I'm not going to. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the found that these, uh, an artist would work with a foundry, which would actually work with the molten bronze. Bronze is an alloy of copper and tin. And after the, the, after the artist ma would make this in either plaster or maybe wood, but usually plaster, once he is satisfied with the result, he then would make <coughs> um, uh, forms of the different parts. So maybe the head, maybe this part of the body, maybe this part, and so on. And <coughs> they would be, um, they would be, they would then. <clears throat> the, in the foundry, they would pour the molten bronze into the forms, and once they had hardened, the whole piece would be put together. But as you can imagine, it would have soldering lines, and therefore then the artist would begin the process of polishing it, removing the line. You can't see a single line on this. It looks as though it was cast by one piece, but it was It was cast in pieces. And uh, then polishes it so that you get this beautiful brown. And you can, I don't think you can see on the camera, but it has a sort of goldish tone that comes through right here. My favorite piece, but of course I've told you that the butterfly that I am, it's always the last one, but, but really, this is my favorite. And I come and look at it every day. Now we are looking at something entirely different to what we've seen before. I mentioned 
I mentioned objective painting, real, uh, realistic painting based on physical <clears throat> reality. Well, you see that here. It's a wonderful little street and it's a snow scene. Look at the children with the sled and the little townhouses. If you are a Baltimorean, and I, I imagine many of you are, you, the name will tell you exactly where this is. It's called Tyson Street, and it was painted in 1939 by Edward Rosenfeld, who was a beloved artist by many Baltimore connoisseurs and collectors. So that you will see in Baltimore, you'll see quite a bit of Rosenfeld. His Tyson Street paintings are among his best. When we look at it, we also get a little bit of history. Edward Rosenfeld was the spirit, the, was the one who started the <clears throat> a small renaissance in this part of our city, um, and and attract which attracted many many artists and art lovers and. Uh, I think actually one of these houses is the one he lived in. So it's just charming and you you could just, as I said, you can jump in there, you can feel the cold, you can pretend you're 10 years old and sledding, or you can pretend that you live in one of these charming little houses. <clears throat> we've been talking about art and we have talked about prints, we have talked about drawings, we have talked about paintings. Now we are looking at what is relatively new, by that I mean a hundred years, um, photography. Photography started in the mid-19th century in France. And uh, at that time, people were just astonished. If you wanted a portrait of yourself, you had to pay a lot of money to a portrait artist and you had sit, to sit for weeks, maybe months, while they, while they painted your image. And what happened then with uh, the camera was that while the, the early daguerreotypes meant you had to sit there like this with, for about 10 minutes or so while they took the photograph, nothing like what we do now. We take our camera up and go click, click, and that's it. But it freed artists, in a way, to, it freed artists to do what we talked about, to do so many things, particularly the non-representational work. This is another Baltimore artist. We are very partial to Baltimore artists. The artist actually is very creative. She will only, she only takes photographs at dawn because she is very partial to the light at dawn. And um, what she does with these waves, as you will be able to see with the three of them, is that she gets into the water when it's very cold at five o'clock in the morning, just when the sun is about to come up. And she will get in there close. And what you see here is the wave rising in front of her and then breaking, beginning to break, right? Um, the color is not manipulated. The color really is nature's palette, um, which is created by light on water at dawn. It is um, a lithograph uh, a color lithograph, as you can see, and it is colored lithographs like this were actually not made as fine art, although many great artists did them because they needed to make a little extra money in order to eat. Even the most famous artists, you know, have a very hard, have had a very hard time. The artist is Swiss. His name was. Alphonse Bavard. And um, you can see these things were also printed 
in the same way, they would have a huge lithographic stone. The artist would draw with a brush on the stone and they would have to do a different color, a, a different stone for each color, gold, blue, black, the golden hair and so on. The style is what we call Art Nouveau and the the, the lithograph was probably printed in 1896 in Paris, which of course was the mecca, the art mecca of the world for so long. The style is very much this florid, wavy um, style that is known as Art Nouveau. <clears throat> and it is uh, if you remember when we came in, I said it is perfectly located. It is because it's advertising beer and this is a pub. So that I would love to have one advertising wine also, but we can have that maybe someday. So that there you have it, Pierre de la Meuse, Meuse beer. And um, these were simply plastered all over the streets the uh, condition of this one is absolutely extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it never left the printing press. Uh, left the printing press, but somebody kept it. And um, as you can see here, now, the artist's name, the artist would not sign these because there were thousands of them, but you can see his name there, Baba Bast. Actually, I said Bavard, but it is Bastard, Bastard, if you will, in English. And over here, we have the um, <clears throat> the uh, printing press, Imprimerie Le Mercier in Paris. Again, this is a beautiful piece and a wonderful historic piece, and uh, we are so fortunate to have it. Thank you so much, and I hope that all of you who are watching this will come and visit us. We are, would be delighted to welcome you and take you, show you our art, introduce you to our artists and our donors and our wonderful building. So please come and thank you.